I always tell this story about when I was a student interviewer and we had these really like kind of relaxed interviews. It was outside in Southern California. We were eating lunch. So it had this really relaxed environment. And um, I was interviewing this guy. He seemed really cool. He was nice. We were having a good conversation. And then he just started cursing, like adding in like the F word and stuff like that, as if you were talking to just like a friend. And it was totally inappropriate. It was just totally this level of unprofessionalism that you just shouldn't ever exhibit in a medical school interview even if you feel totally comfortable with that interviewer they're not your buddy they're not your best friend you have to maintain that level of professionalism throughout the entire thing so we have dr marinelli and dr nelson both on right now there's no way again that i can introduce themselves better than they can other than to tell you they are incredible incredible admissions experts Um, I'm going to let Dr. Marinelli and Dr. Nelson take it away, and I'll see you all in an hour. Thanks, Dan. Good morning, Dr. Nelson. Good morning. Good morning. How are you? Good. Good morning, everyone out there. Thanks so much for joining us. Um, Hope you're enjoying the experience so far. I'm Dr. Renee Marinelli. I'm the Director of Advising with Med School Coach. Um, I've been working with Med School Coach going over eight years now. Um, and I'm also a family medicine practitioner, but I, I actually don't practice right now. I work completely with med school coach. Um, I just love helping out students and trying to get them into medical school and on to the next steps. So that's a little bit about me. Dr. Nelson, you want to introduce yourself? Well, thanks, Dr. Marinelli. Um, it's pretty early where you are, isn't it? Aren't you in West Coast? <laughs> Excuse West me. Coast. Oh, thanks. Um, I'm in Colorado, so it's okay. it's nine thirty, so not too not bad. Too bad. I'm, in, <laughs> I'm in Minnesota, so it's ten thirty. So yeah, we're good here. So <laughs> welcome everyone. It's nice to kind of be a part of this uh, really huge experience. Uh, it's an honor to be talking here today. Uh, honored to be you know working with Dr. Marinelli, who is you know one of our leaders at Med School Coach. Um, I've been with Med School Coach for about three years now, which is amazing. Time has flown by. Um, I've mentored medical students, uh, pre-medical students, uh, all throughout my career. Um, I practiced uh, emergency medicine. I'm a family medicine trained physician, but uh, I always have practiced in the ER uh, throughout uh, kind of rural and suburban areas. And currently somewhat semi-retired clinically um, as I hit my mid-50s. It's harder to work those overnights. So uh, mainly doing mentoring now with med school coach. And then I also do some teaching uh, in uh, pharmacology and physiology for the medical school in in Minnesota and for the physician assistant school. Awesome. Thanks. Thanks, Dr. Nelson. What what drugs do you teach about in pharmacology? (laughs) That was a hard course. I struggled with pharmacology. Well, that's the thing. I mean, you know, you get kind of accustomed to your 20 or 30 medicines that you use in your practice. So yeah. it's, it's required a bit of a review for me to to teach the the medicines that I wasn't using routinely. So it's been, it's been a nice kind of continuing education thing for me. Nice. I remember like the first pharmacology tests, we had block tests in medical school where it was like four hour tests where it was like yep. physiology, pharmacology, whatever else we were doing. And they were like four hours, but I studied for like the pathophys part really good and way ahead of time. And then I was like, I'll leave the pharmacology for the weekend before. <laughs> and I failed that test. <laughs> yep. It's, it's a lot of say, memorization, a lot of memorization. So much. And it's just like, sometimes the mechanisms are really tough for me to grasp. So, and I remember that was the one on like beta blockers and all of that. It was like sure. such a hard section to dive into and yeah, not do well there, but <laughs> <laughs> it turned out okay. Well, even, um, I mean, I took uh, pharmacology back in 1995, 94, somewhere in there. And there were <laughs> half the medicines back then and there are now. I mean, the new medicine. Yeah. With all the monoclonal antibodies and all those things is it is is pretty intense totally and you know um, my husband and i we were in medical school together and like we used to make up funny names and stuff for all the drug names because they are so hard to memorize like i'll i'll i still remember us being like on don setron because it sounded <laughs> like a computer <laughs> that's great 
<laughs> and then when we heard it said the right the real time on Dancetron, we we're like, yeah. what? what? That's what it is? <laughs> Great. Oh, well, anyways, we won't bore everybody out there with our banter, which we probably could talk for a long time if if we are just let off leash and, you know, can just <laughs> chat. But let's get started on getting into medical school, everything you need to know. Um, I'm going to share my screen over here. Um, as we go through, we're going to try to get through this presentation, um, but we should have a good amount of time at the end to do some Q&A. So um, I'm hoping to go around 30 to 40 minutes on the presentation itself and then spend the last like 15, 20 minutes or so doing some live Q&A. So if you have questions as we go along, please ask them in the Q&A um, button, not the chat, because the, the chat, there's lots of other stuff going on. There's things about WhatsApp which I have no idea about, but Q&A, that will be the place where you can start um, asking some questions. And I think as we go along too, we'll put some important links into um, the chat function as well. So pay attention to that. So this is gonna be really an overview on getting into medical school and it's a lot. So, if, so for some of you who can scan this, if you're not on your phone watching this, um, scan this QR code. This is the ultimate guide to getting into medical school. It has all of the information that we are going to be presenting here, um, but in much more detail. And hopefully we can drop the link for this in the chat as well. Um, Dr. Nelson, are you drinking iced coffee? I am. <laughs> Me too, but I just noticed, oh, I don't think you can see. Look at mine. It's like fully cream. <laughs> I'm trying to lose a few pounds, so I didn't leave the cream out today. <laughs> oh, man. I just am like, cream. <laughs> <laughs> Love it. All right. So, oh, no, my picture didn't show up. That's weird. It was there this morning. Well, anyways, you can imagine that this was a graph of different GPAs and MCATs, and it's something that we use a lot. I'm going to pull it up real quick just as... We're talking, Dr. Nelson, as I pull this up, will you just yeah. um, tell the group a little bit about the GPA and MCAT and how sure. important that is? You bet. So um, the GPA and MCAT are kind of your entry point into the application process. It gets you kind of past that first filter screen. Uh, in fact, if you don't get past that filter screen, none of your other written material materials are going to be reviewed in the holistic as, uh, application process were in front of the admissions committee. So you need a good GPA and MCAT score just to get to the admissions committees to review all of your other things. So starting with the GPA, you know, the average cumulative GPA of those that get accepted to allopathic medical school is around 3.75. And that stayed consistent despite, you know, a very large increase in volume of applicants. And the reason why, in my opinion, that has stayed consistent is because GPA is not apples to apples from institution to institution, nor between, you know, uh, different majors at one institution or even between, you know, one course. You might have two different uh, professors uh, teaching organic. One might grade inflate more than the other. So you, you need a good GPA to get in the game, if you will. And if you're between, you know, that three, six to three, nine range, you're going to get in the game. Mm -hmm. The MCAT is a bit more important because it is more apples to apples. It is more standardizable. And that's why uh, when the volume of applicants has gone up over the last decade, when, when it's doubled, um, the MCAT average went from 508 to what's uh, quoted as 512. But I think that's a low estimate. I would say more around 514, 515 is the average of those that matriculate into allopathic medical school. Yeah, absolutely. So it's just basically so important. And the reason why I, I took the time to pull this up is because I think this is just such a great way to kind of gauge where you stand. And not everybody has taken their MCAT when they're thinking about applying or a year out from applying. But once you have your GPA and MCAT in hand, then you can really kind of take a look at this table and say, hey, here are my chances. And I think there's import, uh, important kind of takeaways from this too. So let's look at somebody like with a 3.6 to and a 506 MCAT. 
they have about a 40% chance of getting in. And this is based on, you know, the previous cycles, applicants, um, and other years. So overall, it gives you a good sense of how did those applicants perform that have similar stats as me? Obviously, there's other things taken into account, but as Dr. Nelson said, really to get your foot in the door and to have your application reviewed further, you need to have this kind of baseline stats. So somebody with a 40% chance, you know, that's not somewhere that's great to start. That's about the national average is about 40%. We love for this to be higher. And so what I really like to do and as an exercise with students is if you are starting off at like a 40% chance, what are the things that you can do to just change that right away? Can you retake the MCAT a few more points and get up to a 56% chance? That is That helps a lot. Moving your GPA, which is tough to do because that takes a lot of time to really bump up a GPA, that's going to get you up to 52%. So there's kind of different levers you can pull, and this graph um, really helps the applicant determine what that is. And the other thing that I really like to point out, though, too, is that, you know, this graph only or this table only goes up to 3.79, doesn't stagger past there or greater than a 517. But even those people with the top stats only about 83% of them are getting in. So it's not a 100% acceptance rate just because you have amazing statistics. There's other things there. Um, there's other parts of your application that you really have to have down and be thorough on. And that's kind of what we'll talk about for the rest of this presentation. So yep. let me let me stop sharing. And if, if you wanna comment, go right ahead, Dr. Nelson. I was <clears throat> gonna say, excuse me. Um, that I kind of look at the admissions process as kind of uh, algebra or chemistry equation. You know, there's different factors in that equation. And somebody asked in the in the in the Q and A how to balance out kind of a lower GPA. Well, if you have a lower GPA, the first thing you need to balance that out with is is a higher MCAT. And because if you don't have that, you're not even going to get to the holistic phase. But if you do get to the holistic phase, there are other ways that you can balance it out, and that's what we're going to kind of focus on as we go through here. Mm hmm. Absolutely. So what are those things, like we said, that you can do to really help maximize your chances? And that's so great that you said that of picturing it kind of as an algebra equation. I was never good at math, but that's kind of how I have it in my head. You know, there's 3x plus 5y plus, <laughs> you know, <laughs> 7z times whatever. And it's all just that balancing act and different levers you can pull. But these are the ones that I think applicants have a ton of control of. Sometimes they come to us and, you know, maybe they had not a stellar GPA. Maybe yep. their, you know, academic track record wasn't super great, but they've done some things to improve that. But they're still kind of that poor track record before, or maybe they're just struggling with the MCAT. It's not impossible to get in, but what are those other things that they can really, you know, put forward and really try hard on and control? And this is it. And so we'll talk about these individually, but you know, I think the most important thing is really being prepared and to plan. Um, There's so many different steps in the application process that you really have to know what's coming, what's expected of you, and be sure that you're on time um, with that. So as we go through, one of the things to talk about specifically is that timeline. And so this is like some graphic I made years ago, but it, it, so it's very pretty, but it is all very, very true still. It's the entire process of applying to medical school is really about a year and a half long. Um, and so you start in May of the year you're applying and that's when you submit your primary application. So I'm just kind of going over some terms for some people that maybe not be familiar. So that's when you submit the AMCAS application, which goes to all USMD schools. And then following that, in the summer, you submit secondary applications, which are a series of essay questions from each school. And then after that, late summer and into the fall, you do interviews. And those interviews continue from the fall into the spring. And somewhere in that fall to spring timeline and through winter, of course, um, you may get an acceptance, you may get put on the wait list, and you may not know where you're going and get pulled off the wait list until May. So the whole process is really like over a year 
And then like, you don't actually matriculate into medical school until July or August the following year. So it is just a huge process. It's a marathon. There's so many little key points here and so much to do to prepare. Exactly. And I would actually, uh, if we we were to update this, I would extend this way back at, (laughs) at, you know, high school graduation. It would be kind of the start of this process, excuse me. And because uh, you know anything after high school really is relevant to your medical school application, mm-hmm. and um, we've actually started a a new port, part of med school coach called pre med coach, and um, what we're doing is working with uh, students earlier in the process to kind of build that application going forward, instead of kind of looking back at application time, going oh I wish I would have done this or done that. Mm-hmm. So the earlier you can start on this the better because there's a lot of preparatory things that we're going to talk about in a minute such as letters of recommendation you know activities research all those things that you can't get done you know during this timeline Mm -hmm. yep absolutely and so when you're at that point in the application cycle it's kind of like to put this here is that you know you really need to be paying attention to important dates For those of you that are applying this year, these are actually the opening dates for AMCAS and TMDSAS. TMDSAS is the Texas application and AOCOMAS is the DO application. They haven't released theirs yet for this year, but it's probably around the same time as May 4th. Um, But basically schools use, most schools use something called rolling admissions, meaning they start reviewing applicants as they receive them. And so you basically, to break it all down is you want to be as early as possible because you want to be one of those first applicants that gets reviewed, gets offered a secondary, and then a subsequent interview, and then possible acceptance. Um, The later you are in the cycle, the more applicants that they have ahead of you. And so your chances just get less and less and less. And so we really coach people to log into AMCAS on May 1st, start putting in all their information, start entering all of their courses, everything and then hit submit right around May 28th. I mean, it doesn't have to be on May 28th, but I usually say within like a week or so is really the goal. Yeah. I get a lot of uh, students that are either reapplicants or doing a, a, a general advising session um, on why didn't I get in? And the first thing I do is I look at their submission date. Yep. Yeah. I, and correct me if I'm wrong on these statistics, Dr. Marinelli, but um, I think there was a study that was done a few years ago, on, and it was done on the TMDSAS application mm-hmm. process because that's a bit you know, a smaller volume to to focus in on. But if if a student, if there's two students that are otherwise pretty equal on all other parameters, and one student applies day one, another student applies in August, there's a 10% chance in that student applies who applies in August compared to the student of who applied day one with all other things equal. Mm-hmm. I don't know the exact data, but I know I remember that study. And yeah, it is definitely very, very significant. Um, Dr. Nelson, I'll let you take this one away about talking a little bit about extracurricular activities. Thank you. That's a nice small topic to to touch on here. <laughs> <laughs> you have one minute. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> No. Okay. Well, extracurricular activities is such a big topic. We kind of break them into uh, we call the big five, and uh, they're they're delineated on this slide here. Um, volunteer work, community service is always kind of uh, letter A and me. I know it's uh, in the middle there. Uh, leadership is number two. Uh, These are pre- no and not in any particular order. Exactly. Uh, lead, uh, research is number three. Then shadowing, and then the fifth is clinical experience. So we're going to kind of dive into each one of those just uh, for a little bit. Um, Starting with uh, volunteer work community service, uh, how I look at this is this is one of the few areas of the application that you can kind of interject a bit of your narrative or your passion. So I encourage students to do volunteer work in areas that are meaningful to them for whatever reason so that they can kind of discuss on their application why they did that particular uh, community service instead of just kind of going and, you know, uh, punching a clock at a food bank or whatever, just to get hours. So there's a quantitative aspect to it as far as you need a certain amount of hours in order to have shown that you have a commitment to this uh, community service volunteer work, but also a qualitative aspect to it. And the fact that do something that's meaningful to you, give back to a community that's less fortunate with something that you uh, you're passionate about. 
The second thing is leadership. And this is probably the most misunderstood extracurricular, in my opinion. A lot of times students will come to me and say, I have great leadership. I have, uh, I am the vice president of the physics club and the treasurer of the pre-med interest group. And I'll say, well, what'd you do in those positions? Well, not much. We didn't meet very often. I say, <laughs> that's a title, right? That's not leadership. <laughs> leadership does not require a title, nor does title equal leadership. So uh, I, I've seen admissions committees that I've been on really um, give a lot of weight to initiatives of leadership that doesn't have that kind of delineated title or role. Mm -hmm. Now, that's not to say those roles aren't good. They are good, especially if you are, uh, you know, obtaining some responsibility in those roles. But it's also kind of a, a nice addition to set yourself apart a bit to take on leadership where it wasn't really expected of you. So taking on independent research projects, um, st starting your own volunteer initiative, uh, you know, tutoring, mentoring are leadership positions. So anything really where you take on more responsibility than was expected of you would be considered leadership. And it's more so how you translate that leadership then onto your application and the written materials than it is the actual title of your leadership role. Research that's, is the next one. That's such a great point. I'm sorry to interrupt you, oh, but please. that is just such a great point because um, you're so right. Like if somebody just has that title and then they're either trying to talk about it in their writing or in an interview, they're going to find themselves totally stuck because like you said, it wasn't actually significant. They didn't actually do anything. To, they just held a title and yeah. that's going to be meaningless and actually reflect pretty poorly, especially if you were asked, hey, what'd you do as a vice president of the physics club? <laughs> oh, right. you know, we met. Yeah, I mean, it would just, yep. it would just be crickets. And so that would be something that could be actually detrimental. And so there is this nice balance too of trying to find those activities, but making sure they're meaningful and they're going to contribute to you and your application. Yeah, there's only so many minutes in the day. And with, you know, a lot of that taken up by academia, you have to be very selective in what you mm -hmm. choose. Research is the next. Um, we recommend students do at least a year of research. And uh, a longitudinal research experience is uh, a better experience uh, than kind of these short burst experiences. So, you know, there's all, uh, it's really attractive to apply to some of these kind of six weeks, eight weeks, summer uh, re research internships. Yeah, that's better than nothing. But if you can find something a little bit more longitudinal at the institution you're in school at, that, that in my opinion, is a, a better opportunity. Uh, maybe you can then do a presentation or even get a publication with your name on it. Shadowing is the next one. And in this case, um, shadowing, we uh, recommend at least shadowing three different specialties uh, for at least a day or two just to kind of get to know what you're what you're getting yourself into. And then clinical experience, which the difference between that and shadowing, shadowing you're a fly on the wall, clinical experience you're interfacing with patients. So um, if you have the lead time, and granted I'm a bit biased because my career was in the ER, uh, being an EMT is a fantastic uh, clinical experience. You're, you're interfacing with patients uh, that are, uh, you know, not easy to interface with. And uh, that's getting that clinical acumen to be able to connect with them, communicate with them, um, you know, intervene with whatever their needs are. Uh, you know, I give this analogy when I'm working with pre-med coach students is, okay, if you have two options, one is to, uh, you know, be an EMT and the other one is uh, to scribe at a dermatology clinic. And your goal is to show the admissions committees that you can connect with patients that aren't always easy to connect with, which one of those two is going to do the better job of that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. And there are ways to find clinical experience where you're working with patients and other healthcare staff without that extra training as an EMT or like a medical assistant. But I find it more, more and more difficult for applicants, whereas when I was applying, I, I felt like I found that pretty easily. I was able to secure like this hospital volunteer where they, they provided a bit more training. We worked alongside nurses and stuff. Uh, I, I think those positions are probably 
becoming more and more hard to come from, come by, excuse me, um, just from talking to different applicants. Seems like a lot of people struggle with that. And so having a little bit extra training like an EMT or an MA can really help get your foot in the door and have a position that is going to be much more significant than just you know, maybe doing a volunteer at a hospital where you're delivering water to patients, you're going to actually be involved in patient care. Yep. Um, and I think the training, if I'm not mistaken, it's pretty limited, like, I mean, well, not limited, but it's pretty light. I think it's only a few months of training to get certified as an MA or an EMT. So yep. doing that over the summer or partially online, you know, is a, definitely a great option. Exactly. Another couple of good options that I've helped students find recently that have been very fruitful. One is volunteering for hospice. Mm -hmm. and just profound clinical experiences come from that. And it's very easy to onboard with that. Plus you're doing a great service for these patients. Mm -hmm. Another one is working as a phlebotomist. Most mm -hmm. uh, hospitals will even, you, you, they don't, there is an opportunity to get certified as a phlebotomist, but it's not required by most states. So a lot of hospitals will train you kind of on the job to do that. Oh, that's a great point. Yeah. And I put these little bullets at the top too of this slide and Dr. Nelson um, touched on them, you know, but I think the best activities too are the ones that, like you said, are longitudinal that shows you've had a commitment over time, um, not only in research, but all of these things. Like I think those long-term activities instead of hopping around from one to another and gaining, you know, 15 hours here, 30 hours here, but really dedicating yourself to an organization and to an activity, those ones are going to be more profound on your application. And those that naturally transition to a leadership role, like too, like I've seen so many students that, you know, be start as a volunteer in the hospital and then become a volunteer coordinator you know, they move up in that position that really shows growth and maturity, initiative, all of those things. Um, an original idea, you know, as you mentioned, like maybe they start their own independent research project. I've seen students start like a, um, a nonprofit. I mean, those are so cool. It's just such a great way for them to show just how much you know motivation and drive they have how they are willing to take the extra step to achieve something that they're interested in and help people awesome and then the other thing too i think sprinkling some international work in there too it could be really great uh, med school coach partners with global medical brigades and they offer different brigade trips abroad and i think Maybe that's not your main focus. I think it's important for students to have experience both internationally and domestically in the healthcare system. But I think having some international work can really, really give students some great perspective, um, cultural competence, all kinds of really nice ways to grow and mature by spending some time internationally in different cultures and maybe a bit out of your comfort zone. Yeah, the, and these extracurriculars are, are not mutually exclusive. So one thing can kind of count for, for two different categories. Mm -hmm. For example, um, I had a student that I worked with in pre-med coach, and at her institution, they did not have a global medical brigades organization representation. So she actually initiated that kind of uh, setup, a construct at her institution, which is a great leadership initiative for her. And also she went on a, a global medical brigades uh, uh international experience yeah that is so awesome yeah what a way to kind of take that initiative create an opportunity not only for herself but then subsequent students too i love yeah. that yeah another example of doing that of kind of taking initiative and, and sharing it with other students i have a student that i worked with that um he was really interested in working with patients that have aphasia uh, that can't speak after having some sort of stroke or uh, brain injury. And uh, he created this, uh, uh, I think the acronym is DATA, D-A-T-A. -A. I can't remember exactly what it stands for now, but um, they were bringing art therapy to patients with aphasia in order to give them an opportunity to communicate. Since they can't speak, they were communicating through their artwork. Oh, wow. That is really neat. That is so cool. He's and what a thing to kind of 
be able to discuss during an interview. I mean, I could imagine if I was interviewing that student, I was already thinking about how many questions I'd want to ask them and follow up and just exactly. you know, turn the interview on that and be like, wow, what are some things you've seen? Like, how did you see people improve? I mean, there's so much there. Right. And what a great stepping stone for some future career. I mean, he could go on to be a neurologist or an ER doctor. It doesn't really matter, but he's really taking that extra step Yep. to help patients. I mean, that's, that's amazing. And the really cool thing is he, he reached out to me later and said, you know, I'd really like to share this with other institutions. So I connected them with a couple other students at different uh, universities and wow. helping them set that up at their institution. Very cool. Very neat. A lot of stuff you can do out there too. And I think, you know, as you said, these are kind of like the five pillars. These are the things that we really look for and admissions committees are really looking for, but you can spend your own uniqueness on this. It doesn't just have to be this bread and butter research or you know, following around a doctor in the hospital. Like, Do, do something that you're interested in, you're passionate about, and that's really going to make a difference too on your application. Yep. So going on, um, I'm going to let you take this one too, Dr. Nelson. Oh, but of course, this is just another light topic, you know, just for an easy Saturday morning topic. No, seriously, we could do, and we have done whole webinars on just the personal statement. Yes. But yeah. if you want to just take a few minutes and tell students about what it is, why it's so important, and, you know, why we put such an emphasis on it. Sure. So the personal, the personal statement is kind of uh, your first uh, representation of yourself when you get to that holistic phase to the admissions committee. It's typically the first thing that they kind of hone in on after getting through that first filter. And um, the first thing I would recommend with the personal statement is get some help with this. Um, I myself am not a great writer. I was never been a great writer. Uh, when when you and Dr. Maida, um, you know, set up Med School Coach, I think it was such a brilliant idea to bring that triad um, team approach to the writing materials where we have, uh, you know, writing advisors who are experts in, in writing uh, at, on as part of the team that help the student and the physician advisor with the written materials so that not only is the content good, but the, the content is written well. So I help the students kind of get the content organized and then the writing advisor and the student work on making that look nice and, and, and the most impactful from a writing standpoint. Um, one of the pitfalls I've seen in uh, students over the years and working with them is they write their personal statement from the perspective, uh, sole perspective of why they want to be a doctor. Now, that is part of the personal statement, but I would say that it's more important to write from the perspective of why you will be a good doctor. Mm -hmm. And so... There's a, there's a little bit of both. And I would say that the second one is, is the most important on, on kind of showcasing the skills and aptitudes, the competencies that you have acquired through your different experiences that may, will translate into you being a good doctor. I tell students when uh, admissions committees are reading through hundreds of these and trying to find, you know, the one or two or three out of those hundreds that they're going to accept. They're not looking for the coolest reason why you want to be a doctor. They're looking for to see to find who's gone out and done the, the, the things that will set them up to succeed in medical school. Completely agree. Completely agree. And I I mean, just at a baseline too, if you are writing a personal statement and you're submitting an application, they know you want to be a doctor. You don't need to convince them at that point. You've already taken all these steps. So more importantly is why you're going to be a good doctor. I think the only caveat I will say to that is some emphasis, some more emphasis can be placed on maybe that balance has shifted a little bit for um, non-traditional applicants that are like career changers. Um, I think those people maybe should take a little bit more time to explain why they want to be a doctor. Like I've seen nurses transition to becoming a physician. I've seen people in business or financial institutions applying to medical school. And I think those people, there's always this little bit of doubt with in medical school admissions committees, like, are you sure 
you want you know, <laughs> to stop your career right now and really? then go to medical school and residency and all of this. So I do think maybe those people in those special circumstances maybe emphasize that career trajectory a bit more. But for the you know more traditional student, yeah, it's it's all about what is going to really make you stand out. What is going to make you so qualified and that they want you because they're going to like, wow, they're going to be a really excellent physician one day. They're going to be an excellent colleague to work with. Yep. Agreed. And, you know, when, when I work with those career changers, um, you know, it's important when they talk about that, okay, switching trajectories to focus on the right reasons for switching. You know, it's, mm -hmm. it's not so much, oh, uh, I, I want, you know, some, financial stability and career <laughs> careers. I mean, that's not the right reasons. Um, it's more so what, what is unique about being a physician? Well, uh, there's a lot of leadership involved. There's a lot of uh, complex decision-making involved, you know, so focusing on those things of it and then showing how you have then displayed those aptitudes in different uh, situations so that yeah. you'll, you'll do well in that situation. Yeah, absolutely. Um, just for time's sake, we're going to move on from the personal statement again, like we could spend an entire webinar on this. So, um, hopefully, um, Owen or someone out there could drop in the chat, some resources or a link to our personal statement guidebook that you can download, because we know this is a struggle for a lot of students. And sometimes the biggest struggle is just putting something down on, you know, paper, not really paper anymore, typing something and just getting started. So we have tons of resources out there to help you with that. And I don't want to, you know, make light of the personal statement at all because there's nothing light about it. Um, but just since this is more of an overview, we're going to move on. And the <clears throat> before you move on, uh, Dr. Marnelli, I want to say yeah. one thing if that's okay. Um, yeah, of course. Uh, one thing to keep in mind when you're writing this personal statement is knowing your target audience, and number two, knowing the goal of this essay. So if you would, if you give a well-written personal statement to a literary expert and don't explain the narrow target audience and the narrow goal, they will rip it to shreds, mm -hmm. and that's why. One of the many reasons why the personal statement is so difficult to write is because it's such an unusual document. And, you know, with the uh, narrow target audience, you know, these informative statements such as, you know, it takes hard work and dedication to become a physician. Well, you're preaching to the choir and mm -hmm. it's going to come off as really condescending those types of statements. And the, the goal of the essay, you know, an illustration of that is sometimes students will write about a very transformative um you know, experience when they were shadowing, but they end up, uh, you know, showcasing the skills of the physician they shadowed, which doesn't do anything for the goal. Mm, good point. Dr. Nelson, I want to ask you as ER, how do you feel about when students, I've seen this so many times where students were like part of a, a code, like, and for those of you that don't know, like uh, code is basically when a patient is crashing and on the verge of death. And so every healthcare practitioner around rushes in to try to save this patient. And it's pretty dramatic and often terrible experience. But I've seen a lot of students write about, oh, the time I was part of a code and essentially how neat it was. <laughs> um, <laughs> what are your thoughts on that? <laughs> because I always read that and I just kind of am like, it almost shows a lack of maturity just because there's nothing good about a code of, of course, like the, you know, the, it is an adrenaline pumping experience and it's pretty fascinating to see the things we can do and the healthcare team coming together to really work, to save a patient. But like codes are terrible. Like yeah, they, they are, are one of the worst parts of medicine. Cause they're just yeah. so the outcomes are not usually good. Anyways, right. I just thought we'd I'd, yeah. I'd sidebar on that. I, I, I've not seen it done well many times. The only times I've seen it work is if a student writes from the perspective of what they did during the code. Yeah. So like if they were doing ch chest compressions and kind of the emotions behind breaking the ribs and, uh, you know, how they reconciled with that. And, or if they were kind of uh, being a liaison with the family and kind of consoling family during the code, that that, that would work. But 
for the most part, it doesn't. You're right. Yeah, yeah, totally agree. Anyways, moving on, <laughs> we won't spend a lot of time here, but I wanted to put this in here as part as the preparation process of, you know, that we talked about in the beginning and making sure you're planning for the next steps is preparing and planning for your secondary application. So as I mentioned earlier, almost every school you apply to is going to send you a secondary application. And it's just a series of essay questions and money that you have to send to the school to move on to the next step. Um, but, you know, students get inundated with these. And sometimes, you know, you'll, it's kind of a random process. You'll, you'll receive maybe one secondary request one week, and maybe the next week you'll receive 10. And then they're just scrambling to write a ton of essays and get these turned around quickly. And we usually recommend like a one to two week turnaround after receipt. So it is just a stressful time. And so I think one of the best things students can do is just prepare them, get them ready. And fortunately, schools use the same prompts almost every year, year to year. Sometimes they change, but usually it's very minor and you can usually prepare enough to get yourself ready and change it a little bit. But um, our sister website, perspectivedoctor.com has all of the secondary prompts from the previous year. And so what we recommend doing is as soon as that student's done with their primary application, go on here and start pulling up the schools that you applied to and start drafting out your, those essays. And so then when you actually receive that secondary request, you can have that essay ready and then turn it around really quickly. When I when I do those uh, advising sessions on with students that are reapplicants, and you know, I said the first thing I look at is when did they uh, submit their primary application. The second thing I ask is when did you submit your secondaries, and mm -hmm. how long after you received them did you get your secondaries submitted? Uh, this is the hardest part of the application cycle from a work standpoint. Mm -hmm. The interview cycle is the hardest from a psychological standpoint. From but from an effort standpoint, this is the hardest because these are time stamped. And if you don't submit them back within a week or two, the school's gonna think you, you're you not interested in them. And, mm -hmm. and some will actually have a hard lockout date on their upload portals uh, after that two week period, you can't submit the secondary anymore. So it, it, it takes a lot of uh, coordination, organization, pre-writing is key. So getting you know those common essays pre-written, edited, ready to kind of copy, paste and tweak is is vital. This is also, in my opinion, the rate limiting step, which mm -hmm. determines how many schools you apply to. Because mm -hmm. that's a common question we get is, how many schools should I apply to on a primary? Because it's easy to just keep clicking and adding schools to your bucket. But you got to think about, okay, how many schools can I realistically return secondary applications yeah. within, within a two week period? And that's usually like max 30 to 40. I would say 30. The wheels really fall off the cart after 30. Right. Giving the secondaries back. I yeah. would say the average is between 20 and 30. Uh, mm -hmm. 20 is very reasonable. 30 is where it really starts to get hard. Yeah. I saw one student, I think the max I've seen somebody was 70. Wow. But that they never got to all those secondaries. They applied to 70, but they never got, I think maybe they got to 50 or something, which is still very remarkable, but they were just drowning in these essays. And it's even just logistically, it's difficult to, to um, keep track of it all. Okay, did yep. I get a secondary from this school? Did I write it? Did I pay? Did I submit it? Like there's a lot of logistics even just to take care of and think about. Yep. So it's like, you are right. It is such a rate limiting step, but it's so important too. And yep. shouldn't be overlooked. Yeah, um, we've seen students that they get overwhelmed and they copy, paste and tweak and they ac accidentally leave the, the last school's name on the oh. next school secondary. You might as well just <laughs> cross yeah. that school off. Oh, I've seen that happen. It's, just, it's brutal. It's, it's brutal. Yeah. yeah. Um, also during kind of the secondary time frame is there's these newer-ish situational judgment tests or virtual assessments, most notably is Casper, the AMC preview. There's also Kira. There's also Duet through the same people that offer Casper. And so we won't spend a lot of time here, but I always just like to throw this up here because these sneak up on students and they don't realize that this is like a requirement and they'll be like, wait, I have to prepare for Casper. I don't know what to do. And 
this is not the MCAT. This is not a test where you're going to spend months and months studying for. It's probably a week or two of some preparation, maybe practicing the scenarios. Um, and that's it. But more importantly, it's just getting this up on your radar that you need to do this around the same time as when you're submitting secondaries, because this is going to be part of your entire application. And in order to get offered interviews, you really need to have these completed. Um, not all schools require them, but at this point, it's basically like if you're going to have one school that requires at least one. And if you do it, if one school requires it, you have to do it. And that will be distributed to school, to every school that requires it. Again, we can talk more about this at another time. We have resources on this, but it's just something to kind of put out there so that people can start thinking about it and not get blindsided in July. Yep. And, and you know, students come to me all the time with different uh, things that they find on the internet and, you know, uh, advice they receive and so forth. And one of the things that I've seen that's kind of silly is advice to, you know, study hours and hours reading ethics books and all this stuff, for, mm -hmm. uh, preparing for these and they're really not trying to plumb the depths of your ethics knowledge. What they're looking for in the are the in these situational judgment tests is the situational judgment, which means <laughs> how do you navigate through these? What is your navigation process through challenging or ethical scenarios? And when we prepare students for these, we really work on okay, articulating that navigation process. Mm -hmm. How would you work through it? You know, mm -hmm. showing your work. Yeah, and exactly. And these aren't highly, you know, difficult ethical decisions of, you know, you have a patient in the ICU that can't make decisions for themselves and there's no family members and they, you know, blah, 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 blah. Like, that's not what these are. The, these situations are like, your friend wants to use your gym membership so she doesn't have to pay. Like, <laughs> what would you do in that situation? I mean, these are, they're meant to be more daily situations that like college students or around college student that age would encounter and how would you make a decision how would you work through that situation so yeah you're right I think having some background on like ethics can be helpful but you you're not spending you know doing a crash course course in ethics right now that's not what this is um and finally on here is Another topic that we can uh, spend an entire webinar on, but I'll try to make this brief just because well, I you were going to throw it to me again. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I'll let you I'll let you take a rest for a second. Um, <laughs> but because I do want to get to questions. I mean, there's a ton of questions out there. We won't get to them all, but hopefully we can answer a few of these kind of hot questions out there. Um, you know, the last part is your interview. And again, we will spend entire webinars talking about the interview. So um, don't make light of the interview. It is super, super important. Um, that's really, I think at this point, they like you on paper, you have your foot in the door. Now they want to make sure that you can be, a, you know, a fun human being, somebody that is easy to talk to, can relate to, they can see you as a colleague or as somebody you know that that's teachable and you can work with. It's 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 an interview, just like a job. How is this person going to perform alongside me? Is this somebody I want to work with every day? Is this somebody that I don't feel like I could stand working with? So it's it's really about your personality and who you are, and they're trying to get to know that and get a feel of that. Um, I think the the great thing about an interview is usually a good interview can get you to an acceptance, but a bad interview where you're unprofessional, you're not performing right, that's going to be an immediate rejection. So it's so important to prepare for these, do mock interviews, practice the common questions. If you have an MMI interview, which is those are a series of more ethically related questions, those are really, really crucial to take a lot of time to prepare for. Any any final thoughts there, Dr. Nelson? Yes, get help with this. Get help with this. Um, you know, one of the uh, amazing benefits of med school coaches, there are 50 some physicians that work with this company and you could do an, you could do an interview prep session with 50 different physicians if you wanted to, yeah. an hour long each and getting, you know, different feedback, different perspectives and really honing those interview skills because it is such a crucial aspect. If you make it to this point, it's 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 really 
a 50 50 chance of getting in after this your your, mm -hmm. your, your odds go up significantly um at, at that particular institution and you know it's such a fine balance between uh, you know, not being a robot. And that's all I tell students a lot. They are not looking for a, you know, a super intelligent ro AI robot. They're looking for <laughs> someone with humanity, but they're also not looking for, they're looking for professionals and maturity as well. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. I worked with a student uh, that I could not figure out why this person did not get accepted. You know, he was very articulate. His, you know, his parameters are all good. Well, it wasn't really an interview thing, but I thought it was going to be an interview thing, but it turns out on his profile picture on his application, he was doing this. Oh, no. <laughs> so the point of that story is, you know, be be humane, be energetic, be upbeat, be enthusiastic, but don't, you know, don't be like your it's your social club. Right, right. And maybe when I said like be fun that's not the right word and I just said that and I when I said it, it as like that's not really, really what I mean I mean it is you want to be personable you right. want to be somebody that you can talk to and have a conversation with conversation with but that should always be professional always 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 I always tell this story about when I was a student interviewer and we had these really like kind of relaxed interviews. It was outside in Southern California. We were eating lunch. So it, it had this really relaxed environment. And um, I was interviewing this guy. He seemed really cool. He was nice. We were having a good conversation. And then he just started cursing, like adding in like the F word and stuff oh. like that, as if you were talking to just like a friend. Wow. And I mean, it was totally inappropriate. It was just totally this level of unprofessionalism that you just shouldn't ever exhibit in a medical school interview even if you feel totally comfortable with that interviewer they're not your buddy they're not your best friend you have to maintain that level of professionalism throughout the entire thing agreed agreed so you know finally we won't go spend a lot of time here but you know this is really kind of assembling all of these different parts that we talked about and broke it down and again we could spend so much time on each one of these topics but you really have to bring this all together, be this entire package and present it to medical schools. And that's what's going to get you an acceptance. It's not easy, um, but it's worth doing. And with the right help, you can certainly do that. And on the, I'm just going to take a quick, quick minute real quick to talk about med school coach. So as we've mentioned throughout, we are a team of physician advisors. We've been around for over 10 years. And basically it was started by Dr. Mehta, who's right here, when he was on an admissions committee and he just started reviewing applicants and he's like, man, this essay could be so much better. These interview skills could be so much better. So he thought about why not coach people and help them along the way? Why are people just doing this by themselves? And so since then we've helped thousands of students really put that best foot forward, starting as Dr. Nelson mentioned early in college, saying, you know, hey, here are the activities you need to do. Here are the courses you need to do. This is how well you need to do. This is when you need to start studying for your MCAT so that you can be fully prepared for that application process. And then once you get to the application process, that's where we're gonna really help you start preparing, planning all of those next steps and making sure that you have all those ducks in a row, you know what you need to be doing, you can have a fantastic personal statement, you can be coached to death for <laughs> with through interview prep, but basically making sure every step is as, as perfect and as done as well as possible just to maximize your chances. So, um, you know, we'd love to work with you. We really enjoy working with students. Obviously, that's why we're here. Um, and that's why, you know, we we took some time out of our Saturday was so that we can try to impart some of this knowledge for the next generation of physicians to really help them um, achieve their goals. And if you are interested in, you know, our advising packages and working with us and learning more about pre-med coach and getting started early in college, or maybe you're applying now and thinking, oh my gosh, I really need help putting together this application scan this QR code, you can book in a meeting with our enrollment team, and they can talk you through the next steps of what that looks like, how to get signed up and how to get started with us. And I believe we'll drop the link in the chat as well. 
Um, we don't have a ton of time for our Q&A and I apologize about that. There's just so much to talk about, um, but let's see if we can get to a few burning questions sure. um, before Bye. moving on to the next, next part of this pre-med experience. Um, Dr. Nelson, I have one that I think would be a good one to answer because sure. we get this question all the time is, does the school that you go to undergrad for impact your chances for admission to medical school? I mean, and we've seen this in a variety of ways is, do I have to go to an Ivy League? Do I have to go to a high tiered school? What do you think? Absolutely. I mean, it's, it's, it's part of many things in the equation, but it, it's a smaller factor in the equation. Um, you can uh, definitely go to uh, medical school from pre pretty much any four-year university. I think it's harder to go to a community college and get into medical school mm -hmm. without kind of going from community college to a university then to medical school. But uh, you don't have to go to an Ivy League. If you go to an Ivy League, sure, it helps you get into kind of the top or you know higher tier medical schools. But if you want to go to medical school, any four-year university is sufficient as long as you uh, you know perform well. Mm -hmm. I was yeah, gonna, I, go ahead, please. Go ahead. Sorry. I was going to say that kind of along that line too, I saw a question. Uh, one of my roles in teaching is I am the program director of a special master's program. And it, it said, you know, what is the, the, what is the factor of kind of balancing a lower GA, GPA with a special master's program? My comment on that is the, the, the additional course courses go into kind of the pooled uh, cumulative GPA. So it's going to be factored in that way, but there's also an additional kind of look at, okay, how did you perform in an environment to, similar to medical school? So if you are picking a special master's program, make sure that you're picking a program that is kind of the equivalent of, you know, intensity that medical school is. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Um, one, one question that I've seen is how many hours in each extracurricular activity? And we get this question all the time. And as Dr. Nelson mentioned earlier, you know, it's not really about just the number of hours. It's the, the qualitative experience as well. But I mean, part of it though, too, is yeah, you need to have a, a sufficient amount. You can't apply with 50 hours of really in-depth clinical work. That's not going to be significant enough. Um, the number of hours is really tough because there's such limited data on what the hours are for people getting accepted. But usually what I recommend is somewhere between like a minimum of 200 to 300 hours at a minimum for research, volunteer work, clinical activities. Um, and then around 50 to 100 hours of shadowing is kind of where I I want students to start. Obviously, anything above that is great, but that's kind of at a minimum of what I'm seeing for students getting accepted. Exactly. And I would say I've seen students with tons of hours uh, that if they don't translate their experiences well onto their application, it's worthless. Totally. Um, I know that we did not get to a lot of questions and I apologize, but we are certainly here to answer questions. Um, hopefully you can you check out the links that we dropped and you can you know contact us, reach out. Um, there's so much good information at medschoolcoach.com and perspectivedoctor.com, but I know that we need to wrap up and hand it over to Dr. Dan. So um, thanks you guys so much for joining us this morning. This was a lot of fun. Dr. Nelson, it's always a pleasure. So I appreciate you know, your company. My pleasure too. So thank you. Thank you everybody for joining us. Yeah, thank you so much, Dr. Nelson, Dr. Marinelli. You guys are awesome admissions experts and really have helped so many students along the way. This was an awesome presentation. 